Oh, this makes my heart happy. I've missed you all so much. And what a time it's been. You know, there's been so much happening in our world. And, um, and one of the things that's brought me comfort has been the writings of our co-founder, Myrtle Fillmore, in her book, How to Let God Help You. And one of the um, chapters in there, she's talking about evil. And, um, you know, we've been seeing evil in a lot of forms lately, haven't we? I mean, my gosh, you know, in action in the face of an, a pandemic that needs action, sure looks evil. And evil acts that have reignited a movement for positive change in our world. There's so much for us to respond to in the spirit of truth. I remember when I was growing up and the word evil was not something that crossed my radar screen a whole lot. The main place I heard the word evil was in the Lord's Prayer. And when I was at Unity School and I was studying, it was so interesting to me that the Lord's Prayer, when I heard it there, people were substituting the word error for the word evil. And in time, I learned what that was about. I learned that you know, some people say, well, we don't believe in evil and unity. Not exactly true. <laughs> because what I was taught was that, you know, we're all one with God and each other. And if we forget that, then the actions that are taken based on a belief in separation, that somehow I'm different from this person or they're different from me, those acts can truly be evil. And um, that just helped me to put things in a whole new context. And Merle carries that forward in this chapter of um, How to Let God Help You. It's a strange title. It's called Meeting the Cloven Hoof. That's not a term you hear much, is it? <laughs> just sounds so weird to me. But that idea of the cloven hoof, that was like some kind of representation of the devil or evil in the context of her time. And, um, you know, and she talks about that idea of seeing or experiencing evil in our lives. And she said, you know, that this actually gives us an opportunity to bring a situation to the surface for healing. And in that experience of transformation and healing, there can be a whole lot of chaos. And sometimes that chaos can feel like hell. But she said, that can be temporary. If we take the action we know we need to take to make positive change as we come through this time together. Thank goodness, then the, in, in the midst of chaos, that God lights the way. And in the Gospel of John, we find words along those lines. In chapter five, verse, or chapter one, verse five, we hear this, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. And if we think of chaos, thank goodness for a path that we can take through it to a better time. And we hear this also in the words of Dr. King, where he said, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. And he was such a wonderful example of what we can do when we can love the best in a person but also see the rest and reveal to that person the nature of their oppression so that they can see it better. And then that love can come through even stronger. 
it's a tall order because our feelings and our emotions come up. We don't want to have to do that. But wonderful things can come out of it when we do. I, I've seen some inspiring stories lately of people who've done just that. And one of them is a woman um, named Carmen, Carmen Castillo. And she was born in the Dominican Republic. She had um, three daughters and she had an opportunity to move to the United States with her daughters. And she wanted a better life for them. And so she made the move. Um, and they moved to the Providence, Rhode Island area. In fact, to Ward 9 in that city. And she got a job in a factory setting and she worked so hard and it was inhumane. What she experienced there, she and her coworkers was truly evil. They were treated like they weren't fully human. And she knew she had to find something better. And so she did, she found an opportunity to work at one of the big hotels in uh, Providence. And so she went there and she started working and she started experiencing the same kind of thing. Where the people who were doing the hospitality work in that hotel and the other behind the scenes work were treated like they weren't real people. And she knew that somehow things could get better. They had to get better. This evil had to be broken through. And so she and some other workers started organizing to affiliate with a union. And it was terrifying. They didn't know if they'd come through this experience alive. But they kept on going. It was very chaotic. And with time and with revealing to people exactly what they were doing to these workers in a way that they came together with power things started to change. They were able to unionize that hotel. And things got better with opportunities for the future for the families, with income, with health care. And, you know, going through all this experience, Carmen started getting more involved in the larger community, too. And she started seeing some of the same disenfranchisement, some of the same problems in the larger community, in the world where she lived and otherwise. And she knew that positive change could happen. And it wasn't going to be easy. She saw that, you know, in her district, which was really diverse and a lot of Dominicans, that there were, you know, like, I mean, in the larger community even, more than 50% of the workforce were blue collar workers. And they were treated like they weren't even there. Just the Dominican vote was 14% of the state. And she knew that she should do something big. You know, those people who would recruit folks to become candidates for local government, they never paid any attention to blue collar workers. But she put her name on the ballot for the city council in Providence. And um, boy, did she hit a lot of resistance. You know, she was going to work during the day and early in the morning at the hotel. And, and they were up to late every night. You know, all these volunteers coming to her home. Her living room didn't have couches anymore. It just had charts on the walls. And they'd be out knocking on the doors in all kinds of weather. And people were making fun of her in the media, on the radio, saying, oh, she was just a servant. All she could do was push a vacuum. And she ended up winning in 2010. More resistance. The more success she had, the more resistance she hit. But she was reelected again in 2014, again in 2018. And when she didn't let go of her, hospi her, her hospitality job right away, people were criticizing her and saying, what's wrong with her? It was only 18000 a year to be a city council member. That was part-time. She had to support her family, so she just kept doing both, kept doing both until she became a shop steward with the union and, um, and on the executive board for that organization. And she just continues in that work today. And things are shifting. Things are changing for people because of that action in the face of chaos. 
in the face of all kinds of stuff, it's starting to get better. I am. Um, I also appreciated the courage of a woman named Henrietta that I heard about recently. Henrietta Wood, she, um, she was born in Kentucky and um, she was born into slavery. She, um, she was a teenager when she was taken away from her family and she was sold to this Frenchman and um, he had a wife and family, and they took Henrietta with them to New Orleans. And this Frenchman eventually left New Orleans. He went back to France, and he left his wife and, and, and children there, and Henrietta stayed there with them. And his wife soon left New Orleans. She went up to Ohio, which was a free state, and as soon as she got there, she went to the courthouse and signed papers so Henrietta could be free. Now, his kids back in the South were not real happy about this. Henrietta was living a good life. I mean, she was having to do housework, which she didn't care for as her first choice, but she had her freedom. And, um, and the kids back home were scheming. And they started collaborating with human traffickers that were just across the state line from where Henrietta lived and worked. And they paid off Henrietta's employer to get her to go across the river to that slave state. And they were waiting for her there. They took away her personal copy of her freedom papers and they started moving her south again. And, um, and she knew she had to fight. Her life, she had known hell. She had known that she didn't have to be in hell and she felt like she was back in hell again. And she caught the ear of one sympathetic innkeeper where she was locked up. And that innkeeper filed a lawsuit on her behalf for her freedom. And they wouldn't let Henrietta testify. Of course, her kidnappers denied any wrongdoing and lied. And then they found out that the courthouse had burned where her original freedom papers were. So she wasn't able to keep to get free because of that lawsuit and she was taken back south and she was bought by this one of the largest slave owners i mean he had over 400 slaves and her life became hell again when the civil war was wrapping up and the emancipation proclamation was about to be signed, she and another 300 slaves were forced to march 400 miles into Texas to keep them away from their freedom. And even when Juneteenth happened in Texas, she didn't have her freedom. She was held prisoner for another year. It was four years after the Emancipation Proclamation when finally, she got her freedom and she took her son with her and they went back upriver, back to where they had been. And this time though, they moved to Chicago and she remembered the, the one who had enslaved her and he was a rich man now. And she filed another lawsuit. And this time she was able to testify it took eight years for her case to go to trial because of the evil of her kidnapper and that kidnapper's attorney, creating all kinds of chaos, claiming this, claiming that. But she had her day in court. She sued for $20,000 in reparations. And it was a jury of 12 white men. And here she was, all dignity, all respect, and after two days, they came back with a verdict in her favor. They did not award her 20000 They awarded her $2,500. That's about $65,000 in today's money. But 
it was still epic for that time. Newspapers across the nation were publishing about it. But because it was such a small amount, her name didn't live on strongly through history. But what she and her son did has made a world of difference. They bought a home. She put her son through law school. He was one of the first African Americans to graduate from Northwestern Law School. And he built a career for himself and she and he together set the tone for their family to have a different kind of experience. Even in the midst of redlining in Chicago, even in the midst of all kinds of oppression that they experienced living in the South Side, they knew from their grandmother, or their great grandmother who had lived to age 92, they knew from her son, their patriarch, what was possible. And they were able to establish professional careers for themselves and carry on in a way that continues to bless through the generations. This whole idea of reparations has come up before and it's come up again. And it's time has come. You know, the time, the time has come. The evil has been revealed. It's ours to take action from that place of spirit that place of knowing, knowing the truth for ourselves and for others and what is possible. And if we remember that God's present and active in all this, we know the support is there for us to take the action we can one day at a time as well. I'm so grateful to remember with you these truths, these eternal truths, and that together we're moving through this time. Bless you, friends.